Good morning, good morning. Long time no speak. What a lovely day. Oh my goodness. There's sheets all over the place. I've cleared out the barn and every time we get new sheets we put them in the barn to use as rags but I never never use rags so I've cleared them all out I'll have to have a word with uh, Mrs Angry she'll get them off down the recycled textiles bin how are you anyway? First day back at work, the Tuesday after Easter Monday. We had last week off, so normally with holiday we used to take four weeks, which was week before Easter, week in or, or after Easter, week in between Christmas and New Year, and two weeks in the summer. And then when you've got a larger practice, you could actually uh, stay open for uh, three of those four weeks by coordinating the surgery into two halves, which consist of one dentist, one nurse, one hygienist, and one part-time receptionist. You can take the week off before Easter, and the other dentist, the other nurse, the other receptionist, and the other part-time receptionist can take the week off after Easter. That The only proviso with that is that the um, part-time receptionist have to go full-time for one week while the other part-time receptionist is off. The thing is it's they, they're either just about to have a week off or just had a week off and the you know them, them having weeks off does r rather depend on uh, the other receptionist playing ball and working full-time when they're off. Uh, for, for usually for one week full-time that's not not a massive deal for them. So then you can do a similar arrangement in August. So for example, half the surgery can have the first two weeks in August off and the other half can have the last two weeks in August off. And then although obviously you are running a reduced service, um, you can stay open every day, apart from uh, Good Friday, Easter Monday. You're open through all of August. Now, Christmas is a little bit different because it's not so easy to sort of split up so we tend to uh, just say oh there's a lot of scaffolding tend to say that uh, everybody gets off uh, between Christmas and New Year and to be honest with you everybody expects you to be shut during that week anyway so uh, very few businesses are open that week and everybody appreciates some time off that wall it's not it's being rebuilt slowly isn't it it's taken about three years to get that wall really well it blew down and uh, belongs to the local MP that house. And it's taken a long time to rebuild because I think he's having it done with traditional lime mortar etc. Yeah so that's uh, how the holidays work. now. The problem with this holiday for me is that I've got a sneaking suspicion when I get back we're going to be faced with a problem which we had before the holiday but which has been getting very very gradually worse in the sort of same way that hydraulic pressure builds up behind a dam. <coughs> and that's or, or on a submersible, <laughs> that's probably a better the dam can probably take the amount of hydraulic pressure that builds up behind it. Whereas, uh, anyway, never mind. Forget, forget the hydro. Forget I mentioned hydraulics. Okay, so we are just getting increasingly busy. Now, this is reassuring, and I speak here as someone who worked most of his practicing career under fee for item, where. If you didn't work, you didn't earn anything, and so being booked a long way ahead was a real comfort blanket for you. And uh, even now, uh, you know, private dentistry, which works the same way, fee for item, you know, you're still a very 
cognizant of the fact that if you're not working, you're not earning. And so that's why, for example, the BDIA exhibition, which was on recently, is uh, held over Friday and Saturday. It's because uh, they, they probably would have preferred, I think it used to be Thursday, Friday and Saturday, and they probably would have preferred it to be Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, but they just couldn't get the NHS dentist to come during the week. And that was because of this old mental sum that we all used to do, which was that we all used to know the value of the work that we did and how much we earned and, and uh, you know, bearing in mind that, uh, you know, in, in inflation adjusted figures, if we were earning 200 or 250 pounds a day in the 1980s, then, and you went to the BDIA exhibition on, on and you lost a day's work, you not only did you have to add on the cost of transport and possibly hotels and, and possibly staff travel, but you had on to add on to that the greatest figure of all, which was loss of earnings, uh, opportunity cost. And so that's why they used to open Saturday, because uh, uh, the people who wouldn't come on the week would come on a Saturday, because for the most part, they didn't work on a Saturday morning, or they could, they, or they could come Saturday afternoon or something, you know. And uh, it's, it was always entertaining to go on a Saturday, or we used to have a stand, the uh, General Dental Practitioners Association, and go on a Saturday, because um, the sort of dentist that came in on the Saturday was very recognisable, you know. <laughs> Obviously uh, very committed to prescribing as much work as possible on the NHS. Prematurely grey, a bit stooped and uh, uh, followed around like a school group outing by uh, his uh, wife who was the practice manageress and the uh, and the staff, all in big crocodile, all with bags trying to grab as much stuff as they could. But, um, no, we are, we are now, I would say, more busy than we want to be. Bearing in mind that I've always said that being booked up two weeks ahead is about ideal. And I think, and you could say, okay, angry you know you've just had Easter off what do you expect you're going to be booked up an extra weekend you just had a week off and that is true to a certain extent that is true however there's this hydraulic pressure again right which is building up which is that we are very slowly very gradually getting booked up further and further and further ahead and we know uh, other dentists have got this problem because patients who come to us very frequently say I've given you a ring uh, and I'm so pleased that you're taking on patients because I've rung every other dentist in the area and none of them are taking on patients and I've covered in another video the problems of not taking this personally and also why we are not booked up as opposed to other dentists mainly because we are more much more efficient in terms of how we uh, how we operate and how we've managed by the charging in advance to reduce our no-shows to zero. Um, so, there, there then comes, we then will have to, I think, reconsider, and I intend to do this with the staff because I think it's a good idea to enfranchise the staff and, and empower them to uh, contribute to the debate you know, because they are the treatment providers, almost in so much as you are. I mean, you're, you're all treatment providers. You're the provider of capital. You're the entrepreneur. You're the, you know, the IT expert and the HR manager and all that. But they are treatment providers. So, go on, change the red. Go on, go on, go on. I dare you. Yeah, too late. Why change the red? Why has it changed the red? Why? There's nothing waiting coming the other way. What was the point of that changing to red? If not, not to slow cars down for no reason at all. <coughs> anyway. And, and the general principle involved is this. Do you, at some point, shut your books to new patients? Or do you say to patients, 
our books are open, but you you are going to have to wait a month for an appointment. Now, I've got to say, I came from a surgery, my first surgery in Julian Hunter's at 15 High Street, that was routinely booked three months ahead, four months ahead, and so that colours my thinking on this, because. Um, It was quite often the case with that with that surgery that when you you had your checkup, you booked another checkup six months ahead because then you got your choice of dates. If you waited until you got the reminder, then not only did you you got your choice of dates, but you might have to wait another four months. So it becomes ten months in between your checkups. And the patients learned that and they adapted to it. They, they understood it, they didn't necessarily like it, but they knew how to react to it. They coped, right? And the other thing which tends to make things worse is that once you get booked beyond a certain threshold, you have to make everybody's appointments, all of their appointments, because supposing someone comes in and they need five appointments for fillings, you have to make those five appointments. If they want them a week in between each, then you have to make them all right at the beginning. Because you can't make an appointment and then say, like, why don't we make your second appointment? And then two months later, then have another filling. Having said that, the British public do like to slow their treatment down and have it done extremely inefficiently. And I think to a certain extent it's, it's a sort of a inherited, it's a heritage from the National Health Service system whereby um, let me just, I'll, let me get this straight because in America for example you have to travel large distances and basically your NHS, your, your dentistry is done privately and so you're paying for service and you want it done like yesterday preferably yesterday morning because yesterday afternoon would be too late so they want everything done as quickly as possible and of course so does the dentist because it's the most efficient use of surgery time whereas um, in the UK if someone comes in and you say you need 10 fillings they automatically think oh that's 10 appointments whereas of course it is you know you can do like a filling on a six and, and extract an upper eight or something at the same time. In America, this uh, famous guy, Ed Silco, who wrote the, the seminal introduction to, you know, the, the overlap between time and productivity and, uh, and dentistry, uh, would quite frequently do everything on the left in the morning and everything in the right in the afternoon. And the patient would then go somewhere and have lunch, you know, in the meantime. But in this country, that's never really caught on. And now that uh, dentistry is more in the private sector, where people are sort of seeing it as an expense, which uh, is an unanticipated expense, an unwelcome expense, unbudgeted for. Not, you know, people thinking, oh, I've always been on the NHS. Oh, expletive my NHS dentist struck me off I'm gonna to have to look around I'm gonna to have to go private and then where am I gonna find 600 quid to have my work done of course they're gonna to want to have it spread out over time now my other major influence on on the decision is uh, P.T. Barnum <laughs> the uh, circus owner who, who uh, famously told the box office to never to have put up a sign saying sold out because although they may have sold out of tickets for that performance they possibly hadn't sold out of tickets for um, the next performance and whereas uh, they may have sold out of tickets for the, the current day they and possibly tomorrow but they probably not next week so he always encouraged people to make inquiries about when they could come now the argument against uh, keeping the books open and, and just before I go into the opposite side of the argument 
I have to cite my own again personal experience where I had there was a dentist in Tunbridge Wells. He was recommended to me. Uh, we I rang him up and he and he said uh, he, he would take me on, but uh, he's very busy, and so there would you know there's quite a wait for appointments. And I get the feeling that he probably, if I'd been a member of the public, he probably would have said no. But because I was a dentist, and, and I think a fairly well-known dentist, he was he was like, yeah, okay, we'll take you on, but, you know, I'm not going to kill myself to do it. Now, <clears throat> it's a bit <clears throat> difficult if I'm going to sidetrack <clears throat> someone of my generation who grew up... <clears throat> in a sort of a, a era of professional courtesy where doctors and dentists did favours for each other because we, we both understood that a dentist would be no good if he was sick and couldn't work and a doctor would be no good if he had toothache and couldn't work. So, I mean, uh, arrangements were made, you know, um, treatment was facilitated for people who were in the medical profession. There was a certain amount of solidarity, uh, solidarność between us. Um, now, of course, that's that's completely gone out the window. And the days when, as a dentist, you could go and get your treatment done at the Eastman Dental Hospital, gone. And uh, you can, and this is, I think this is obviously because dentistry has become commoditized. You know, it ceased to become a profession as such, uh, and has now become a commodity. And as it as it is a commodity, you just can't get a can't get a discount code anymore for any work and you certainly can't get a you, you can't jump the weight in this we are unusual I would say as a surgery in that we do operate the old uh, Knights of the Round Table chivalrous approach which is that we tend not to charge the staff their relatives even their relatives boyfriends sometimes um, anyone who's in pain severe pain or uh, dentists who work locally who want to come and see us uh, we don't charge for any of that and and, and in doing that we're sort of uh, keeping alive a tradition that that's completely died out <clears throat> and as a dentist I don't now if I go and see another dentist I do <clears throat> expect it but I never receive any preference in terms of booking courtesy at the desk most of the people on the desk don't never not even told that you're a dentist, which leads to some funny situations. Um, uh, price you pay the same price as everyone else. In fact, if anything else, you you might pay a bit more because they they know you're a dentist, um, and so you know you, you're you're subject to the depredations, the venality of uh, of the profession, post commoditization. Venality. There we are. That's that's going to be the title of the video. And so, as a result, I had to wait uh, three months to get a checkup appointment, and then another three months to uh, have a to have a crown and some fillings done. And then I was offered a hygienist appointment, which I didn't need, and therefore I had to decline, which was rather embarrassing because. You know, I, I oh, 63, and I got all my teeth, got no pocketing, and I knew, and they knew, and, and I presumably I, they knew that I knew that they just offer everybody a hygienist appointment. Now, okay, I mean, you know, I, I've in the past I've said that my periodontal assessment at examination has. It's not always a six-point gum chart. If I've got a hygienist, then I'm more than happy to say, no, you need to go and see the hygienist for an assessment and treatment. But I don't take perfectly healthy dentists and tell them that they need to go and see a hygienist just because it's the practice policy to refer everybody to the hygienist, which is a policy which is, you know, loved universally by hygienists and by principals who get a percentage of what the hygienist earns but not really uh, you know not always appropriate in my opinion so although the BDA the BDHA BDHF 
BDHA, whatever they're called now, BD shit. They'll, um, I'm sure they'll say, no, you're, you're totally wrong and, and you're a shocking practitioner. And how can you say that not everybody should see a hygienist? And, uh, everybody's teeth are gonna fall out because of you. Now, because we nearly at work, I'm gonna go over the one reason which I think is uh, in dentists' minds when they decide to close books, and that is because they want to maintain the service level agreement for the existing patients. In other words, the patients who uh, you know have been with the practice a long time, they're used to making appointments a week later, and then they find that they can't make an appointment for two months. Now, I'm not inclined to give that argument much weight for two reasons. One is that they have they patronise a popular practice in the same way as they you know they discover a little restaurant it's lovely the food's excellent uh, they can always get a table and then two years later they go back and find that there's a queue around the block to get in now that's that that happens it happens you know the other um, the other uh, the other consideration in that argument is that um, as a dentist, you know, if, if if you've got 10 patients and two of them say they're going elsewhere, then it's a disaster. You'll lose sleep at night. Whereas if you've got like, over a thousand patients and one of them says that they're fed up with waiting for appointments, then again, they go and find somewhere else. Then your attitude to that tends to be good luck, you know. Hello, security. What are you security for? I hope they haven't had an incident at the school. I hope they haven't had a break in. I haven't they nicked all my servers? <laughs> so there you go. So you probably guessed that my, my attitude is almost certainly uh, I'm going to not close the box. And the, the other reason is that once you close the box, you know, word gets round. No, don't no, don't ring Den Derek, the angry dentist, because his books are shut. And um, people who, um, from other surgeries who have been referring your patients, will stop referring your patients, because it will feed back to them that their books are shut. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm, so I'm not gonna do it. So I'm gonna keep the books open. But uh, it doesn't mean I'm gonna work any harder, but, the books, books are going to stay open, so let's um, we'll see how it goes. All right, lovely. Nice to talk to you. Bye.